Uh, this is a tragedy uh, related to a natural disaster that we have seen uh, visited uh, on our, our country. Uh, the devastating impact that hurricanes Irma and Maria have, have had on the U.S. Virgin Islands and, and Puerto Rico, uh, the current relief efforts that are, are underway on those islands, and how we might help in their long-term rebuild, particularly as it relates to their electric grid and their power sector. As, as you know, uh, Mr. President, as you serve on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, I, I have the honor of, of being able to serve as chairman of that committee, and that's the Committee of Jurisdiction for our territories. Um, our committee's history dates back to 1816, when it was then called the Committee on Public Lands. The acquisition of Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Guam in 1898 through the Treaty of Paris led to the creation of the Committee on Insular Affairs in 1899. The U.S. Virgin Islands was included in that committee's jurisdiction following their purchase from Denmark in 1917. Then in 1946, the Committee on Public Lands and the Committee on Insular Affairs merged to form the Committee on Insul Interior and Insular Affairs. And then in 1977, the committees were again reorganized, leading to the current structure of the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. And our committee has had the proud distinction of working with the nation's territories for the last 70 plus years. And, and certainly following hurricanes uh, Irma and Maria, we are committed to upholding our responsibilities as well as to the people of Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And perhaps, Mr. President, it's because uh, I was born in a territory, maybe I need to actually look this up, but I, it may be that I am the only um, member of Congress or, or member in the Senate here who was actually born in a territory, but I feel an affinity. Um, one would not think that there is much connection between a small island territory like Puerto Rico and the large landmass that we are uh, in Alaska. But in many ways, uh, Alaska is always also islanded in the sense that we are not part of, of the continental uh, 48. And so I, I, I do follow with great interest and, and care uh, how uh, Puerto Rico, as well as the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, are, are included. With the current focus almost entirely on, on Puerto Rico right now, it, it can seem just like a distant memory that only two weeks ago, before Hurricane Marina, Maria, we had Hurricane Irma that hit the islands of St. Thomas and St. John as a Category 5 hurricane. And one Category 5 is, is bad enough, but then to have a second Category 5 hurricane hit just two weeks later, this time impacting the island of St. Croix, is, is almost unfathomable. The devastation that we've seen in both the Virgin Islands and, and, and Puerto Rico it can just seem overwhelming. Relief operations uh, for the islands are, are, are different than what you have uh, with the mainland. And um, when you recognize how you move to accommodate uh, relief, everything has to be brought in by ship or by plane. You don't have the convoys of trucks rolling down the highway from an adjoining state. Uh, you don't have the ability to take alternative uh, routes to, to reach the affected area. Um, once goods are delivered to ports, for instance, it's another challenge then to get them from the port uh, for inland distribution. Even under normal operating conditions, moving the amount of containers that have flooded into the territories would be a challenge, but then you, you add into it the debris, the downed power lines, the washed out bridges and roads, the lack of power, uh, the driver shortages, the, the challenges just become colossal. Um, and then you have other limiting factors. You have uh, competition for hotel rooms and other lodging as you bring in relief workers uh, to go into the islands, but also those 
refugees who, who lost their homes trying to leave. So the logistics uh, are, are, again, almost overwhelming, a logistical nightmare. But despite these considerable, very considerable hurdles, we, we do see that progress is moving forward. According to recent reports from the Army Corps of Engineers, Federal and local response crews have been working to reopen the ports and runways. In some cases, we've seen sunken ships that need to be removed before a port can begin operations again. In Puerto Rico, 13 of 16 ports are open or open with restrictions. In the U.S. Virgin Islands, five of nine ports are open or open with restrictions. In addition, 15 of 17 priority dams in Puerto Rico have already been inspected. In the case of uh, Guajatica, in the, uh, the, the dam, uh, it's in the process of being reinforced. The dam's spillway continues to erode. Rainfall has increased the water level in the reservoir. We've seen that the debris and the downed power lines need to be removed to allow the helicopters to place 44 concrete barriers within the spillway channel. They've got 900 super sandbags on their way. Pumps and piping are being procured to help decrease the water level. So there's a lot of hands on deck there. For electricity, um, as of October 1st, 5% of customers in Puerto Rico have had their power restored. And the Puerto Rico Electric Utility expects to have power restored to 15% of customers over the next two weeks. You know, I looked at, at this aspect of it and, and recognized that Puerto Rico, it's still pretty warm down there. I checked the weather this afternoon and it's, it's 87 over the next couple of days, it's 90 degrees. So making sure that folks have, have power, have an ability to, uh, to keep fans, to have air conditioning. Um, this, is, this is critical. Assessments show significant damage to transmission and distribution systems. So again, a great deal of work uh, is yet underway there. In the Virgin Islands, 15% of customers in St. Thomas and 10% of customers in St. Croix have had their power restored. This is, includes the airports and the hospitals. On the hospitals, I would note that both of the hospitals in the U.S. Virgin Islands, one in St. Thomas and one in St. Croix, have sustained heavy damage and may need to be replaced. So again, long-term moving forward, um, some critical infrastructure. We do know that in the immediate term, the primary relief that Congress can provide is through our appropriations process. And we'll soon be considering another tranche of disaster relief funds so that those who've been impacted by these hurricanes have the food, water, and medicine that they need as recovery efforts continue. Other options, such as making the RUM cover over tax payment a permanent and increasing or lifting the cap on community disaster loans may also need to be considered as ways to get the islands back on their feet. Another part of our responsibility, though, is to look at potential long-term <laughs> solutions to persistent problems. And in the case of Puerto Rico, it is their antiquated electric grid and power generation system. I, I am concerned, and I've had, I've had many conversations with many colleagues in, in these past couple weeks, but I'm concerned that current disaster recovery rules um, may mandate that the damaged or destroyed entity be restored with similar material compared to its condition prior to the disaster. And what may seem like a good general rule of thumb in some scenarios, like this one, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. Why, why would we consider spending hundreds of millions of dollars to rebuild what was an inefficient and unreliable electric power grid in Puerto Rico. So making sure that we do right going forward, I think is important for us. I'm going to be meeting with officials with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They've been tasked by FEMA with rebuilding Puerto Rico's electricity grid. So I'm going to meet with the Army Corps and the Department of Energy to see if there is a way to modernize Puerto Rico's grid 
during its rebuild, whether by administrative or legislative action. I think we need to, to look at, at, at different considerations moving forward. Um, there's been discussion about whether it makes more sense to bury transmission lines rather than rebuild towers. Um, we need to look at microgrids and consider whether they should be developed to provide power to communities throughout the island, even if the island-wide grid is down. This is something that our committee has been keenly focused on, is the application of microgrids and how they might be better utilized. Now, I would note, it, note on, this, on this matter that the urban area of Mayaguez is currently receiving power from the hydro gas plant that's located within its municipality. It's essentially its own microgrid, but the damaged transmission lines prevent the electricity from moving to other municipalities across the island. But there are other considerations. The role that distributed generation can play. Um, can these federal entities work with the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, PERPA, PREPA, to develop a demonstration project for the island that would make the grid more efficient, more reliable, reduce the cost of electricity for consumers? These are all things that need to be considered. We had a hearing in the Energy Committee this morning on energy storage technologies, and it was mentioned there that regional technology demonstrations um, might be uh, as, as particularly helpful for, for um, uh, Puerto Rico at this time. Uh, I do intend to, to visit Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands with other members uh, a few weeks from now. I, we know that President Trump is, is there today. Uh, we are going to wait until the st situation is, has stabilized uh, just a, a bit more. Um, to allow for these relief efforts to, to continue, but uh, when we do have an opportunity to, to uh, observe the situation ourselves, I think um, it's worth noting that we will, on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, be holding a hearing on the impacts of, of hurricanes Irma and Maria on, on both Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. I anticipate we'll be doing that in the coming weeks, but we want to look at not only the damage caused and, and where recovery efforts stand, but also lessons learned as well as opportunities moving forward as to how we can rebuild Puerto Rico's electric grid to better than it was before so that it does have a resiliency, it does have a sustainability um, that I think is, is imperative moving forward. Uh, we recognize that, that the islands have, have faced a, a, a real tragedy in this natural disaster. But from this, can we, can we work quickly to stabilize things in the short term, but allow this to be an opportunity to think about Puerto Rico's long-term energy future, uh, an energy future that is more resilient and is more sustainable. So, Mr. President, our thoughts and prayers are with all who were impacted by these incredibly powerful storms as, as they dig out, as they rebuild, as they restart their lives. And just as we will take care of the people of Texas and Louisiana and Florida, I want to make sure that the people of Puerto Rico, the people of the U.S. Virgin Islands know that we stand united with them during these exceptionally difficult times and that we will work with them as partners to make their islands stronger, more resilient, and better prepared for whatever the future may bring them. And with that, uh, Mr. President, uh, I yield the floor.